50 years ago now, that basically showed that, I don't know how many people are familiar with this, probably not familiar with this term, vent, uh, VT1, ventilatory threshold, but basically that is the point at which your training starts to become anaerobic. So if you're, like, if you're running with somebody or cycling with somebody, if you can still talk to them, put sentences together, then it's basically fully aerobic. The point at which you start having to take extra breaths to talk to somebody, it's just starting to become anaerobic. Um, below this threshold, this first ventilatory threshold, basically your recovery is almost perfect immediately after you stop. So you see, this was, this was done on a bunch of athletes, their HRV, so 100% is basically the same as what they had before. You see that one hour or two hours of training, which is fully aerobic, they recovered almost immediately. So they could do, you know, anyone can do um, time aerobically in the morning, and then, you know, you've still got capacity left in your body to do hard sessions at another point in the day. On the other hand, um, when they did, so threshold training, a lot of people are familiar from um, using power meters on bikes and things like that, threshold training, so FTP and, and terms like that. The recovery from threshold training or really high intensity training, so one of the buzz phrases at the moment is, is HIT, which is high intensity training, whereby you work really, really hard, like 100% for very short periods of time. Actually, that's turning out to be a really good way of forcing the body to adapt. And the recovery from that extreme uh, level of exertion is exactly the same as if you were doing it at threshold. So these two lines here, show the recovery immediately after training at either threshold, which is kind of uncomfortable, but, but okay, we can do it for half an hour or, or, or 40 minutes, versus the high intensity stuff, which you do for much shorter periods of time, it's more intensive, is basically the same. So the body doesn't behave in a linear way to, to um, training load and recovery. This is another, uh, these are some other charts from the um, uh, the, the elite swimmers, and basically what this shows um, is that these two are the, the same chart on the top, but what it allows you to do <coughs> is to see that this is HRV, so HF power is a measure of heart rate variability, and this was their performance in meters per second, um, for, for, that's how they measure it for swimmers. So as the training load increased during a periodized block program, you can see that their performance dipped, and so did their HRV. When the training load was reduced in the periodization block, so this would be a taper period here, their performance came back up, and so did their HRV. But what's really interesting about this study was that they basically said the performance in the HRV, you can pretty much exchange the two. So this was the measured performance in meters per second of the swimmers who did a time trial every week, a 400 meter time trial, I think it was every, every Thursday. And the performance that they could predict using the HRV, you can see it was almost perfect. Convert similarly here, um, that, that uh, yeah, from the performance they could model the HRV. So it's, um, it's, some of this stuff is coming out to be really, really interesting. So what about overtraining and under recovery? Well, this was a study done on two um, elite triathletes, uh, where they have one control athlete measuring their heart rate variability um, uh, every day in the build-up to a major event. So the control athlete actually did really well in, in their race, and the black mark here, the, the black bar here is race day. They did fine, not too much recovery load. What you see here was for an athlete that became what they call non-functionally overreached. It's kind of the stage just before true overtraining. True overtraining takes months to recover from. Non-functionally overreached is the stage that you get to before that, where your training is unproductive, you're getting into a negative spiral. Uh, but it, it, you know, it's not a good state to be in. In fact, this particular triathlete, as a result of their uh, overreaching, they started, they got, they got some quite bad viral conditions, which took quite a long time to recover from. But you can see here the pattern is quite different. So the HRV was coming down, and um, during this period, they were judged to be non-functionally overreached, um, poor HRV on race day, uh, poor performance on race day as well, and quite a difficult up and down recovery period. But it was basically enforced because the, the athlete became sick. So the patterns there are quite different. What's really interesting as well is that using conventional indicators for coached athletes, 
subjective indicators, like, you know, how tired are you feeling today? How sore are your leg muscles? Did you sleep okay? How stressed do you feel in your life overall? Basically, no real pattern to tell here with the non-functionally overreached athlete. They didn't say they felt particularly fatigued. They didn't say their legs felt particularly sore. You know, they didn't say they were sleeping badly, and they didn't say they had other stresses in their life. But they performed badly, and the HRV really did indicate, you know, before they got to that stage, um, that it was becoming unproductive. Another one that I just put in for a little bit of light relief is that HRV is also sensitive to other things that you do to yourself. So <laughs> if you want to spend the night in a bar, then you, you can expect to get quite a low reading the next morning. Um, but for me, this has been yeah, it's a bit of a voyage of self-discovery as well, doing HRV every day, because you can see what works for you as a person and what doesn't. One thing I discovered on myself, for instance, I wasn't expecting, was that um, my wife's quite keen on yoga, and she told me that I should be doing some yoga breathing. I said, yeah, yeah. And then I actually tried it, and I found that um, it made my HRV go up by much more than I was expecting. And the effects were lasting as well. So I didn't have to do it every day anymore, but it made my HRV go up. And we've had lots of reports from users of iFleet as to things they've discovered about themselves that work and don't work. Could be to do with sleep patterns, could be nutrition, could be you know, all kinds of things. Could be emotional stress, could be anything. But you can discover things about yourself and thereby you know, avoid things that are stressful, do more of things which, which help boost your HRV. It's actually it's, it's a, it's a great indicator. Effective recovery, of course, causes a rise in your baseline, and if you can color code some of this stuff so that um, you can color code some of this stuff so it's easy to see on a daily basis what's happening to you. So this was a program that I did a little while ago uh, where I changed my normal training to make it much more aerobic in content, much. A low, less uh, intervals and intensive sessions for a while. And this is the baseline. This is the moving average of the HRV. So over a period of three months, you can see there's a steady uptick there. And my performance got, got a fair bit better during that time. This was a study that was done on 10K runners, uh, monitoring their HRV during... And they, they weren't elite ones either. These were um, you know, recreational 10K runners doing about... 40, 45 minutes, that kind of time for, for 10Ks. And um, what this chart actually showed, which is really interesting, was that only those uh, people who did their training so that their HRV improved, those were the only ones that improved their 10K running times, and some of them by quite a, by quite a lot. So if we see here, basically all the black dots are what they call responders in sports science, so it's people for whom the program worked and they got better. Um, all of the responders basically had an improvement in HRV and an improvement in their 10K times, whereas the non-responders didn't have an improvement in their 10K times or their HRV. What's pretty, when you, when you think about it here as well, I mean, 10% off your 10K time, if you're doing 40 minutes, that takes you down to 36 minutes. It's a very significant improvement. And, you know, you can see that the, you know, several people did manage that. And that their HRV, you know, really... Um, really did come up as a result of that. Um, some people sometimes ask, well, you know, if HRV is such a good indicator of aerobic fitness, can you tell me my VO2 max from it? There is a kind of correlation, but it's not very good. Um, so if we look at VO2 max from, you know, recreational athletes all the way up to elite level, there is a relationship there. So you can see that, that things are getting higher up, but it's not that good. So if we had a fixed value of HRV on this scale of 0.4, then you know we've got athletes here from th uh, from 30 through to you have know, all the way up to 60. So it's not. If anybody tells you that you can get VO2 max directly from HRV, I, I don't think you can. But improvements do really uh, really correlate very well. Um, you can have a daily change indicator as well that gives you a training traffic light. So if your HRV you know, has decreased significantly from your baseline on a particular day, then that will give you an amber traffic light. And an amber traffic light really means, you know, your body is not yet ready for an intensive session. So you haven't recovered fully, whatever the reason might be. Might be training, but it might be something like you had a very short night's sleep or you're woken by, 
you know, woken by the baby, or you know, you had something that, that you know, stressed you and disagreed with you. On those days, you can still do aerobic training, but I would avoid doing anything intense. This is actually a Canadian, very good Canadian mountain biker, who recently, um, uh, his, his, his partner had a baby, and the first night that his sleep was broken, you see that had a big effect on him, continued for a second night, and it went right down here. So his performance was, you know, was really bombed out for a couple of days by the, by the fact that the, the baby was sick. So that was not an example of training-related stress, but he said, you know, he, he certainly didn't have his normal level of energy and uh, recovery to, to train normally. Just some practical tips if you do decide that you're interested in, in measuring your own HRV, that taking readings at the same time of day is really important because we have hormones circulating which have a daily or circadian rhythm to them. So you need to establish the baseline on readings at the same time every day. The best time of day is first thing in the morning, as soon as you get out of bed. Just do it then. You avoid caffeine, you avoid seeing what's in your email inbox, other sources of stress, all those kind of things. So do it at the same time every day. Um, it's also some HRV in the past has been done based on lying down. I'm not a believer in that because the parasympathetic side in very, in very fit people basically saturates, so the brakes are fully on and you don't see any more range, as it were, from day to day. So I'm not a believer in doing it lying down. Standing is best if you really fit. So for people who have a very low resting heart rate, so like mm, low 50s or below, you should really be doing it standing up. Um, uh, sitting down is okay in most situations. When you're doing an HRV measurement, you know, try to relax, don't think about stressful things. Um, also, HRV people sometimes do a whole bunch of back-to-back -back measurements and they say, oh, they're all different. Well, yes, they are. Um, and that's not purely random. There, is, there are some systematic effects because as soon as you know about the first reading, it affects the second reading. So it's not a, it's not a great test. There is a fair amount of statistical spread in it as well, but don't worry about it because you create a baseline which is an average, and the baseline is, is nearly always right. It has some little ups and downs, but basically it's right. And the indicators are based on statistical spread, so they will take those little variations into account anyway. Um, also, as we said on the VO2 max chart, you know, don't worry if your baseline is lower than someone else's. It doesn't mean that you'll get beaten by them in a race. So me with some of my, some of our masters cycling group, people will say, I've got a 95 today, so I'm you know, gonna, gonna kick you. It's not necessarily true. Um, people have different measures. There's a guy who blogs quite a lot on our site, um, Irish endurance um, ultra runner called John O'Regan. He has relatively modest scores, like 65 to 70 or so, but he's still an absolutely top, um, top uh, ultra athlete. What's really important is, does, is your baseline going up or down, and what are your daily changes with respect to that baseline? Of course, an interesting thing to do is to compare HRV to your training load using whatever system you use. That could be a, a trim system, could be TSS, could be a, a perceived exertion. Whatever you do, then you know, 